So welcome to our lecture. Uh, my name is Vegard, and my partner is Vilde, and we are talking about news games today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first, I'll just briefly go over our agenda for today. Uh, the first part will just take news games in general, which will be about 30 minutes, and then have a 15 minutes discussion with you. Uh, then we'll have a 15 minute break if that's allowed for. And before we go over to the paper review, which should be around 25 to 30 minutes, and as well as a 30 minute, 15 minute discussion, not 30. So I'll start off with what new guess, news games are. Um, news games, as you may have guessed, is another genre of serious games. Uh, we will not go into detail about what serious games are, as we suppose you all know that what that is by now. However, unlike other genres of serious games, news games seem to be very loosely defined. Uh, the man who coined the term news games to begin with is named Gonzalo Frasca. He said that news games are when simulation meets political cartoons. An example to this can be seen in the slide here. Uh, um, the picture up to the right is a political cartoon of Mel Gibson, who was involved in a drunk driving incident many years ago. And underneath you can see a screenshot from the tabloid game, so you think you can drive Mel. Uh, another description comes from Schweizer, Bogos, and Ferrari, and they say that news games are a broad body of work produced at the intersection of video games and journalism. Next slide, please. Uh, Victoria Cabalis has our favorite um, definition, you could say. She says that news games utilizes journalistic principles to inform users about topics related to the news by walking them through the context of complex situations or systems that are difficult to explain without experiencing firsthand. Uh, this is, as we said, the best, the best um, uh, explanation, but it's a bit of a, it's a bit long. So we have shortened it into saying that news games are just uh, video games commenting on current events using journalistic principles. Now we will we'll talk a bit about the history of news games. Yeah, so news games, where did it all start? I'm gonna start by talking about something that's maybe a little bit unconventional in this kind of course, but uh, I would like to say that uh, the news games kind of started with crosswords puzzles in newspapers, which was back in 1930. Uh, you can maybe call it the infancy of news games, because of course it's not like the typical kind of news games that we're talking about today, because that will be digital games. But uh, these types of crosswords puzzles uh, do technically satisfy, satisfy all the criteria that most scholars agree need to be present in a news game, such as being easy to access, which is the first one because it didn't require more than a newspaper and some sort of working equipment. And they were also a response to actual events to some degree, such as using words that uh, came from recent articles. And uh, they were also supplementary to traditional news. And I'm sure that if the author wanted to, they could also be made uh, to be persuasive, which is the last of the four criteria that uh, most scholars agree on. I kind of think that this illustrates in a way uh, the beauty of news, news games. As uh, Vega showed you in the previous slide, uh, it can be as simple as, uh, you know, this Mel Gibson games, which kind of looks a little, uh, maybe a little tacky, but uh, it illustrates the point. Uh, and news games are usually this type of simple game because of the time constraint and the budget. Another example can be seen on this slide, which is Kabul Kaboom by Gonzalo Frasca. Uh, this is considered to be the first news game made digitally. And uh, it's very sim simplistic and it's uh, made as a political statement and was one of the first news games that were made uh, in 2001. Uh, as you can see, this sort of, uh, it looks very like similar to a political cartoon, uh, which is how Frasca himself describes news games. Uh, the goal is simple. Uh, it's to collect falling food from the sky while also avoiding bombs. And it soon becomes clear that there is no way to win this game and it always ends in failure something that is typical in news games to do. Uh, this way, the player experiences firsthand what the author's opinion was on the, when the event gets simula simulated. And the game mechanic makes it impossible to win, and it kind of reflects on the hopeful situation that was in Kabul, because this was a comment on the uh, war on Afghanistan that the US had. And some oh, sorry, I forgot to click on this. I thought it came up uh, automatically. Anyways, uh, some other notable games from uh, this first decade is um, this one, which is Madrid, which was made uh, as a response to the terror attacks in Madrid in 2004. Vega will speak a little bit more about this later because it's quite a notable game. 
And then we have a game that some of you might have played because this was quite big when it came out, which is Darfur is Dying. This is a little more complicated game than the other two. And it's, uh, it was uh, actually went viral. Uh, so it was released in April 2006. And by September, it was played by over 8,000 people, no, 800,000 people. And it takes place in a refugee camp where you have to choose a character uh, and it, uh, uh, you have to go look for water in the desert. And if you fail to do so, if you get caught by the militia or something like that, then you have to choose another character to go pick, uh, get water in the desert. Uh, the this desert part is the first phase of the game, and the second phase of the game is the one that you can see illustrated here on the slide. Uh, this is sort of like a top-down management management game, where you have to water crops and build houses. And to get to this part, you also, of course, have to do the first part successfully, and then you have to do it again when you run out of water. Um, so the goal here is to succeed uh, in staying in the camp for seven days. Then you have this, which is uh, a lot more simple again, which is uh, food import folly. Uh, here you take on uh, the role of the food and drug administration uh, inspectors in the US. Uh, it's quite simple and the only thing you basically do is to inspect these shipping containers that come in and you have to check that they are not uh, filled with you know, contaminated food or other stuff. And then the last one is also quite uh, well known. It's called cutthroat capitalism. And you basically just play as a pirate commandeer and your goal is to capture ships. It's an interactive simulation uh, of the Somali pirate business model, which uh, the, they're gonna mention a bit, uh, a little bit more about. Uh, not about the business model, but about the game. And this accompanied an article that uh, Bayard magazine published. So it was uh, made as a supplement. Uh, one of the things you will notice when you're looking for these news games uh, online is that some of the older ones are really hard to find or maybe impossible even. And that's because many of these games are browser based and made in Flash, which not everyone uses anymore. And also because uh, someone needs to host these games on websites. And if you uh, have a game that's outdated or has become irrelevant, then you might not want to spend you know, the effort to uh, keep it up on your website. However, all of these are still playable, so if you want to have a look at them, you can do that. I will not play them here, but you can see the photos. Uh, uh, the only one I couldn't play was Kaboom Kaboom, because it wasn't possible on my computer at least, but maybe it's on yours. And now, we're going to talk a little bit about the purpose of news games. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, as of now, we can still not count news games as an independent way of conveying news. Uh, but what it is, however, is a supplement that supports and adds further dimension to existing news, news sources and journalism. An uh, example of this is cutthroat capitalism, as Villa just mentioned. Uh, Wired made an article on the small pirate business model. And while this can be hard to understand in practice just by reading and watching images, news games have the ability to simplify and visualize complex topics like this in a way that non-interactive media just can't. Even if you may not be able to understand everything from the game itself, uh, pairing it with the news source or article uh, provide a greater understanding for the reader. As of now, there are a few studies who show the overall effectiveness of news games, uh, but studies do show that readers and editors both found interactive content on news websites to be helpful in both gain gaining a better understanding and engaging them in the contents. This is probably an area that could be fruitful to continue more research on, uh, because one of the characteristics, I'm sorry, <laughs> the news games have is that they should be persuasive in nature. So that if they are not effective in that sense, then their purpose is kind of defeated. And now we got some examples of how these games intend to be persuasive in nature. Uh, we got the refugee games, refugee games, which you probably know if you read our article, um, such as the refugee challenge or the migrant trail. These are made to teach about the challenges that refugees face. Uh, however, since it's interactive, you get the opportunity to see the choices and the impacts through the refugee's eyes. Uh, the Food is Dying, as um, Ville just mentioned. Um, this game is about life in a refugee camp, living with constant fear and threat of militia. It can potentially increase empathy felt for the circumstances of these refugees. Uh, there was an interesting study done on whether this game, uh, on this game, where the participants played the game with varied levels of interactivity and tested for how much they appreciated the story. After they were asked how much of an unexpected bonus they would like to donate to charity. Yet afterwards they were asked if they would like to donate to a charity. 
and the ones who played the games with a higher interactivity donated more, which is kind of interesting. Uh, another game is Spent, which lets the player look into some of the struggles of low-income family in America. Uh, continuously through the game, you are shown facts about the situations that you encounter in the game, and at the end, you are prompted to make a donation. And the last one we're going to talk about is the Uber game, uh, which is the first game we actually looked at when we started researching news games. Uh, we were talking about maybe showing you a bit of it. Do we still? Yes, here you can see it. Uh, the Uber game shows the, um, shows the reader how difficult it is to make ends meet as only a Uber driver in America. It's made by the Financial Times. Uh, so you are given choices like, where are you going to drive today? Uh, so call Chris. Yeah, maybe it's better to just show you. The game puts you in situations as a Uber driver uh, that can often be um, lead to dilemmas or such, such as are you willing to risk a uh, riskier drive for a higher score or are you willing to spend money on gas and maybe not reaching your destination and such? Uh, and then at the end of each day, you collect all your money uh, minus expenses and such, and you have to reach a certain goal of money within a set number of days. And it's actually really hard. <laughs> so I'd say it's, it um, does show the plight of uh, Uber drivers. That's really all I have to say about that for now. So now I'll go over to Ville again for immersive journalism. Yeah. Uh, as uh, Vega already has uh, talked about some news games, uh, which are mostly on you know social issues and uh, uh, games that try to affect the player on sort of like an emotional level. There's also many different types of uh, news games. For instance, in the 2007 Danish election, and most of the political parties actually had their own games, which is something that uh, is remembered uh, now as uh, being. Uh, very prominent during that election. So it can be used for political parties and uh, in, that, uh, in that term it can also be very effective in showing um, situations and news that have uh, like a lot of various stakeholders and different viewpoints. Uh, one example of this is the migrant trail which was in the article which we'll also talk about later. Uh, which has both immigrants and border patrols as two different viewpoints in the game. Uh, they also show the backgrounds and different motivations of the different characters, which can give like a whole, whole picture uh, instead of like being just, you know, the, sometimes news can be a bit uh, more limiting because it's more of like one person's uh, viewpoint. And then also I would like to mention that uh, news games are a good way to grab the audience in what you could call an attention economy. Uh, by this, we mean that there is an immense amount of online content that always demands our attention at all times, such as, you know, social media and videos and pop-ups and all kinds of stuff that's just uh, basically drawing you in and it's impossible to look at everything. But uh, games can have the potential to kind of grab the audience in this kind of chaotic online environment. And I think that uh, is helpful. Uh, so that's basically where we are at this point. And I will also mention a little bit about what the future of news games could be, because this is a topic that I kind of stumbled upon and thought was really interesting. Um, in uh, February of this year, uh, Forbes.com uh, released an article that said, uh, is immersive technology the future of journalism? And by immersive journalism, we mean the production of news in a form which people can gain firsthand experience uh, of uh, news or events or anything. And the fundamental idea here is to allow people to actually enter a virtually recreated scenario, which rep represents this new story that you want to convey. Typically, you'd be represented by a digital uh, avatar in VR. And uh, some of the examples we mentioned so far, such as DARPA is dying, is typically what you would call interactive journalism as opposed to immersive journalism. Even though the player enters a digital world, world this sort of game doesn't have the kind of deep imm immersion that uh, you need to fall under this category of immersive journalism. There's a very interesting paper made by uh, some uh, researchers at MIT that delves into this topic. And it uh, says that uh, deep immersive journalism, uh, in deep immersive journalism, the users should feel as if they are truly transformed to the location of the news story. 
And if you look on the right side here, this is a very, it's quite old paper by now. It's from 2010, so it's kind of like funky looking. Kind of reminds me of a chicken in some ways. Uh, but uh, this is kind of like a virtual scene that the participants in this experiment saw. Uh, and what this is, uh, is basically an experiment or experience as they call it. Uh, based on detainees in Guantanamo Bay, which was a big issue back in 2010, uh, that they were being held for long periods of time in stress positions and being subjected to really harsh interrogations. Uh, for this experience, they used the scenarios and audio that was found in official US government documents. So this was like, they really used uh, situations that were, uh, had basis in reality. And they recreated the setting in virtual reality. Uh, more specifically, they made a virtual cell. Uh, as you can see from the pictures here, the top uh, left is like the, uh, just like a third person view, but then you enter the avatar and you get a first person view. And uh, the reason why you still see the avatar is because you are looking in a mirror in the second and third picture. While in the fourth picture, you're looking down on your own legs. And so, uh, the device they used to do this uh, was, uh, you know, a head-mounted display, so basically just some sort of VR goggles. And they also used a device they strapped to their chest to synchronize the breathing of the user and the avatar uh, to make the experience more realistic. And the people who experienced this felt a deep unease. And one person even said that it reminded them of the Guantanamo Bay case, even if they hadn't been told beforehand that this was the backdrop of the experience. Uh, in this article from 2010, they remark how this technology at that point is not yet available to the general public. However, today, I really do feel like we are in a different place uh, because uh, some of you may even have or know someone who have like uh, an HTC Vive or Oculus Go or anything like that in their homes. And you can even use the, just your phone for VR these days by mounting it on one of those uh, cardboard headsets that I'm sure you've seen around. And well, there's probably some ethical issues issues that will arise with this type of uh, experience or game or what do you call it. Um, I think there's also some really great opportunities because being able to explore news in an immersive experience, whether it's represented as a game or not, gives us the opportunity to understand a lot of things that are very foreign to us at this point. And in this experience or experiment from MIT, they didn't have it as a game because you couldn't interact with anything, you were just basically lying there listening to what was going on and looking at yourself in the mirror. Uh, I still think that some of the uh, principles used in uh, immersive journalism can be applied to news games as well, and perhaps used in the future to uh, uh, battle difficult topics uh, concerning news media, such as uh, the topic of compassion fatigue, which is when you are continuously exposed to human suffering on the news, uh, can leave you like so fatigued from all the suffering that you just get used to it at one point and it doesn't impact you much anymore. So the article said that this could be a counter uh, for this type of compassion for the And now we're going to really continue on to something completely different, which is yeah. uh, subgenres. Yeah, we will also touch more on compassion fatigue in part two of the study. Uh, but for now, I'll just talk a bit about subgenres. Um, Although news games are genre of serious games themselves, uh, there are enough different opinions of what news games are that they can be classified into subgenres. As I said in the beginning, news games seem to be very loosely defined. Uh, I won't go very much into detail about this, but I think it's important that you know that there are some differences and that this can also help when you're reading articles about this or when you're looking at news games on your own. Uh, the first one we have is a classic news game. I'm um, saying classic kind of sarcastically. Uh, these report on current events in an objective manner with views from multiple angles, although these are seemingly rare, as journalism is biased and persuasive in its very nature. Also, you can't um, reflect that much in a news game on its own, so it's usually one-sided. And that's what we call editorials. Editorials are news games, but with a bias. Uh, they're not propaganda, as the context makes it clear that this is done in a satirical or analytical matter, but just like real newspapers, they can skew a certain way or look at an event from a certain angle. <clears throat> Many editorials are often just considered normal news games by the masses, um, as, most, as I said, most news games are editorials. 
Uh, we'll go more into the difference between propaganda and news games later. Uh, just be aware that the line is very blurred as most journalism is biased. But one can still have a bias and follow journalistic pr uh, principles. Uh, the last subgenre I'll talk about is uh, really just on the edge of news games, you could say. It's what we call simulations, but not simulations like flight simulator or farming simulator, but uh, often historical simulations, which um, try to simulate real world events as accurately as possible. Uh, the most notable example of this is probably JFK Reloaded, uh, which some of you may have heard of, but I will go into that later. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for now, I'll talk a bit about criticism and, criticism and challenges. Uh, news games are often more exposed to criticism and bad press due to the nature, uh, as they often comment on sensitive issues in the world, such as war and social issues. News games are very often quite simple in their design, as they need to be developed very quickly to stay relevant. Often simple presentations with cartoony graphics can seem like it trivializes or uh, mocks matter at hand, or dumps, it down serious sub or dumps down serious subject like war and famine into games for children. Uh, it's also very hard to stay objective, as I just mentioned. Uh, as with complex issues, you can't tell the story from every angle. Development time is also uh, a problem, uh, as journalists aren't game developers and vice versa. This ensures that news games can be expensive and are difficult to make, as it might require outside help. And it's why it's probably not that common yet. It's starting to get more common, but it's just getting there. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, now we're going to getting to the juicy stuff. Uh, news games versus propaganda games. Where do we draw the line? Uh, as I mentioned, the line between news games and propaganda games can be very blurry and vague at times. Uh, with controversial games like the previously mentioned JFK Reloaded or the infamous Super Columbine Massacre RPG. Uh, these games are infamous and are often considered to be propaganda games because of their tacky or insensitive subject matter. Uh, and one can say that these games have no journalistic merit, but there's a case to be made, which I will try to do. Uh, in JFK Reloaded, you play as Lee Harvey Oswald as he shoots American President John F. Kennedy. And this simulation is very true to the real event, uh, but the player isn't scored according to how well they play per se, but rather to how accurate you are to the real event, meaning three shots, etc. Uh, the game's claim was to prove the Warren Committee's findings as true, that the killing was done by only one person to debunk several relevant conspiracy theories, although in a tasteless manner, as the game has been uh, widely panned and associated with uh, far-right image boards and forums and such. Uh, Super Columbine Massacre RPG um, is a game made in the RPG Maker, where the player takes control of the school shooters during the 1999 school shooting on of uh, Columbine High School, which I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, the creator meant for the game to be realistic recreation and also sh show and depict the media frenzy and in misinformation around the events. Uh, you could arguably call both of these games news games as they try to stay, or uh, as they both clearly state their agenda and um, try to go about in, a, in an objective manner with. Uh, events that are still relevant to this day, that being conspiracy theories and school shootings in America. So there is an argument to be made that these are news games, not propaganda. Now over to Villa, who will talk a bit more about development. Yeah, this overlaps a little bit with what uh, Vega spoke about in the, the challenges part, but uh, you're still going to have to listen to me talk a little bit about it again. So in a normal video game development process, you usually have a quite extensive period of time where you do pre-production, where you focus on design, and this can be uh, even uh, months and years on big commercial games. But on news games, you do not have the luxury of having the time for this, and often not the budget either. This is because uh, news games need to be uh, both produced and launched while still relevant. This can be as short as having to make a game in just couple of days, which kind of explains why they're often, you know, cartoony and simple. So this can, I can imagine that this can be quite limiting when producing one. However, the main challenge that uh, you have when developing these sorts of games is that you need to make, uh, um, to, you need to translate the relevance and content into interesting gameplay for the player. And the news still has to be the focal point, and, but you need to uh, translate the news into game elements in an interesting way. So 
So in a way, this actually makes the news your main design constraints when developing news games. In your design, you need to translate these constraints into game rules, mechanics, and challenges, which means that in the end, the rules and the mechanics are an essential part of the mean, uh, creating the meaning and the message of this news game. It's uh, very briefly touched upon, but it's something. And then we go over to the next slide, which is about uh, game mechanics and gameplay. I apologize for having no pictures on these uh, uh, slides, but uh, I didn't really find something that was relevant. Okay, anyway, uh, so some news games actually have nearly no mechanics, or at least may seem like they have no mechanics. Uh, an example of this is Vice.com's uh, Choose Your Own Adventure Renting, or the Refugee Challenge, which was uh, mentioned in our paper. Uh, I'd just like to show you what this looks like, because I think it looks ridiculous, uh, but it's still a news game. Uh, it falls into the criteria of the games. Basically, you're just reading this uh, story about uh, having to move, and you choose to move in here with your uni buddies or significant other or anything. And it's uh, pretty silly, and you just uh, basically click through it. And, oh, sorry, that was not what I was uh, going to do. Sorry about that. Um, these types of games are simplistic, and if you didn't know it, you might not even realize that you're playing a game uh, because you're just clicking through them. However, most uh, news games have uh, well-known and pre-existing game mechanics in them, such as match puzzle pieces or avoid falling objects, point and click, etc. This is because uh, these types of games need to cater to a really large audience of both gamers and non-gamers. And another reason is that when the player understands the game they're playing immediately, the moment they get started, they might absorb the news better as well. Because then you don't have to worry about learning the controls and all kinds of stuff before getting into the good stuff. I'm sure that anyone who's listening who's played a game with difficult controls knows how frustrating that can be. And that's really not the best state of mind to have when you're trying to obtain some new knowledge. If we go back to Kaboom Kaboom, which was one of the first uh, games mentioned, this had the mechanic of fo uh, avoid falling things as its main form of gameplay. And this is something that most people are familiar with and understand really fast. And it's very common to have in like these simple mobile games and stuff. And some games even go as far as to copy commercial games. And this is because news games as they are now don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel with their game mechanics and gameplay because the focus isn't on that. It's on bringing forth a message. And the meaning behind using specific game mechanics may be intricate and require the player to be reflective on both the game content and their experience, even if the game mechanic is really simple itself. Uh, some mechanics even make the game impossible to win, not because of the there's an imbalance in the game or because there's a bug, because it's, as developers like to say, it's working as intended. And uh, one example of this is uh, the game 12th of September, 12th of September, uh, which is a game Vega will show in the next slide. And uh, other games are also intentionally really difficult, such as the Yubu game, which we showed earlier. Uh, that had two difficulties. Uh, it had easier mode and it had hard mode, but both modes are actually really difficult. I have not been able to win it at all. And then there's Spent, which is also really difficult by, um, uh, by intention. And this is, of course, to showcase the struggle even more of the people and the issues behind these news games. This can also be done in the wrong way, of course, which Begel will speak about a little later on when he's talking about bad examples. So, on to some good design, Begel. Yes, uh, I see we're running a bit over time, so I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, we have some examples of uh, games that are good and have that, that have good design, I'm sorry. Um, and we like to say that this is when this is when mechanics and the message correspond. The first example is, as Ville mentioned, September 12th. Um, we have a YouTube link here with a video. Uh, if maybe you want to click on that. Yes. Uh, September 12th is a game where the player is tasked with killing terrorists in a city full of civilians. It's developed during the height of the American War on Terror, as you can probably see from the visuals. Um, the player is tasked, to kill, tasked with killing the terrorists with missiles in a city full of civilians. And, um, but you cannot, the only means you have to do so is, as I said, uh, missiles. And the delay makes it very difficult so, to only kill the terrorists, so you will always end up with civilian casualties. 
uh, when you end up with civilian casualties, the the rest of the civilians mourn and they themselves turn into terrorists, thus creating an endless cycle that is unwinnable. The game's intro acknowledges this fact and uh, flat out straight. Uh, I'm sorry, flat out states that this is an unwinnable scenario that is not contributing to anything. Uh, and that is already happening in the Middle East, thus showing the game's true agenda and uh, statements. On a more lighthearted note, we also have the Brexit bus. I'm not done. <laughs> uh, the Brexit bus is a good lesson in simplicity. In this game, the player drives the Brexit bus along a track, uh, much like uh, those uh, flash games you find online with uh, a dirt bike game where you drive across a uh, terrain or something. Uh, the track, however, this time is a graph showing the pound's value over time surrounding the EU referendum uh, with the chip tunes Rule Britannia in the background. Uh, the game is very simple and easy to understand as it's based on a model most people are probably familiar with already. Uh, and it also, it also only uses one button, uh, that being space or the left mouse button, and that's to accelerate. Uh, the track itself tells the story as you play. As you can see in the image, that big... Uh, Big cliff is the EU referendum where the EU voted to leave EU, where the Britain, <laughs> I'm sorry, English is hard. And uh, also important events such as Theresa May becoming uh, prime minister. Uh, we think this is a very clever game as it's really just a fancy graph and the simplicity of the game is also made for a very fast development time and ensuring the game to stay relevant. Now for the bad design. Next slide, please. And here we have the previously mentioned Madrid. This is a case where the mechanics do not support or coincide with the message. Uh, although Madrid has a touching goal of reminding people that remembrance takes effort and remembering the, uh, the victims of terrorism around the world, it goes about this in a non-optimal way, you could say. Uh, the goal of the game is to press the lights uh, of the candles the victims are holding before they go out, uh, thus ensuring that their memory stays alive, you could say. Uh, however, the lights dim very quickly. I think it only takes three seconds or so. And you have to press the light exactly at the flame, which is very small. And this makes for a very frantic and stressful and not fun game experience, which doesn't uh, leave you thinking about, oh, uh, the poor victims of um, terrorism. It leaves you thinking, why can't I click these damn lights? Uh, a better... Uh, um, uh, Trainer and Matthias suggest that instead of having to click constantly, you could uh, have um, maybe the lights dim out after 24 hours or so, so that it would rather be a daily goal. So it's something you do once a day as like um, a memorial service every day or something, which we think would be more appropriate for the setting. So that's what we have to say about news games. Now we have a prompt for you. Next slide, please. Uh, with the current uh, situation surrounding the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, how do you guys think that news game could be used to uh, educate the population or maybe in the future when we're looking back on 2020, inform people about how uh, humanity reacted to this? Uh, we have had some fun brainstorming, come up with a couple of ideas. Uh, my personal favorite being Rama 10,000 shopping pandemic, the quest for toilet paper. In this game, you have to go shopping before lockdown, evade reckless and sick shoppers by keeping one meter's distance, and make sure to get every item on your list, especially toilet paper, before they're all gone, meaning the timer runs out. Yeah, social distancing in the game is kind of self-explanatory. You know, just uh, keep appropriate uh, distance from other people in the game, and uh, don't get sick. And then there's COVID Quest, which is more silly, uh, where you play as the coronavirus, and you have to jump to people who are not following the infection guidelines, you know, people who don't want to wash their hands or stay too close to people or go to parties, all these kinds of stuff. There's a lot of uh, fun mechanics, such as, for example, disconnected dots. Um, make sure that the dots in the image keep um, one meter distance and see how the image gets sorted. There's, there's a lot of fun ideas for game mechanics. So now we're just asking you if you have any funny ideas. Or if you would like to uh, build on any of the ideas that we uh, have uh, suggested. Or generally comment on news games at all. Yeah, anything. anything it's, open, it's open floor. <laughs> if, if anyone else wants to say something. 
I think it's a really good idea. I like the uh, uh, diverse settings there. I mean, the only thing about the social distancing thing, in order to kind of make it uh, gamify a bit more, I'm not sure if you consider this in your concept, is uh, to have people who intentionally, uh, um, you know, uh, violate the social distancing, right? So it's not you as a player uh, only avoiding uh, uh, proximity, physical proximity, but uh, there also see some sort of enemies or whatever, you know, conception <laughs> you want to attribute to it, that, that yeah. intentionally, uh, uh, derail this whole idea. So uh, I don't know, that could spice the game a bit. And then you can also think about leveling, right? So you have different levels, different levels of complexity, or you work, you emulate how um, how complex or simple it could be to do it in different settings. For example, think about a rural setting, like jovic ish I mean, not rural, but you know, a small town setting uh, uh, compared to let's say Oslo, right? So where it may be quite a bit harder to actually maintain social distance if you're, for example, shopping or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one, uh, indeed. But which one is a question to you, Morbeck? I mean, is there anyone else who wants to chip in? I think it's a really good idea, actually, picking up on this. No? Um, but the, the question is, wh which of those themes and titles, because I was thinking about it while you were talking about it, and some of them definitely have more like a proper propagandistic kind of angle, right? And some of them are really more on the news side. Do you see that boundary blurred as well? Or do you think they would all be kind of news games in a wider sense? Uh, are you thinking about uh, COVID games uh, specifically now or just news games as a whole? The, 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 the ones you mentioned for, you have four ideas, right? And some mm -hmm. of them are clearly, I mean, more about information and learning and so on. But some of them also have a bit of a, at least a, at least a strongly opinionated uh, a view, right? So, I mean, um, and I'm wondering if you, if, you, if you see a boundary there where for some of those themes you're proposing that would be more on the propagandistic side and some of them <laughs> that would be more on the, you know, reasonably informative side. Uh, I know it's hard to say right now, of course. But, uh, yes, uh, yeah. of course, most, if I can say, most news games have a bias, that being editorials. Uh, however, as long as you kind of state your intentions or make it known through a certain medium say for example if you're posting it in the newspaper then the newspaper's bias will through the surely show through the game too as well so but yeah it's a it's a it's a challenge to tackle that's why we decided to include a, <laughs> a slide about it i think also that uh, you know this rama 10,000 shopping pandemic would be more of like a social comment uh, considering all the people who who panicked uh, once the news got out. While social distancing the game would maybe be more of like an informative way uh, of doing it in a more serious sense. And yeah. COVID quests could go both ways, I think. Definitely. I see we have a question, some questions in the chat. Yeah, I can't see the chat, so you have to uh, deal with that. Cool. <laughs> it could be a free, uh, from Nakul, um, it could be a free world like GTA and players can assume a role and take up missions, collect money points or just roam around followers. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a good idea too. It would be a bit expensive to make, probably, but um, uh, <laughs> but it's a it's a fun idea. Maybe you could uh, make a modification for an existing game, mod uh, Grand Theft Auto, for example. Mm. Uh, Bjorn says interesting idea that could have great impact is exploring how the pandemic spreads from individual to individual. That is true. Um, that could be ideas like maybe sort of like um, the the Vice game that you showed, maybe text based to. Uh, more, more of an interactive infographic, kind of. Mm. Clara says, reverse of a zombie hunt, avoid the infected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, oh, there's a, sort of some fun ideas. Mm. <clears throat> I'm sure we will see uh, some news games that uh, uh, have the, this topic coming out. Uh, maybe not uh, soon, but uh, later I'm sure that there will. Or maybe Definitely. soon even. I mean, people have a lot of free time, so they should be making these games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're about right on time now, so we are proposing that we take a 15-minute break before we come back to part two of the lecture, if that's fine by you guys. Yeah, sure. Then let's say that we start again at 12.15. We yeah. also prepared a little uh, funny song in the intermission so yeah who wants <laughs> to play oh, oh, no, okay. no, sorry here you go yeah to celebrate that we're done with uh oh yeah, there's no sounds maybe there's no sound oh too uh, bad well it oh, was well. the at least you got to see the picture yeah we tried so see you in uh, 15 minutes
We can probably just start. If they're not back, then they're not going to say anything. No. Probably. <laughs> yes. Got some uh, funny <laughs> from uh, from Jakob. Left for dead with frantic shoppers instead of zombies. It's really funny. It's moddable. And uh, from Andre, powerful tool to spread news, but since most news have two sides and those games would only show one side and creating game takes money. I think this could create some unbias. Uh, I agree. I think it's if it is already a polarizing issue, it, if you're not careful, you could probably polarize it further. But I, I, I don't think it's a big issue, but it's something worth taking note of, I think. So yeah. You do, have, however, get the opportunity to show both sides. You do. Like, uh, through, you just have to make sure that you actually have people who represent both sides also contributing to the development, I suppose. Yes. Like in the migrant trail. Yeah, we'll get a bit into that. You can see some uh, really good example, I think. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yes, and uh, now we're over to part two of the, uh, of the presentation, uh, which we'll talk about the paper we've uh, selected for a topic. Uh, the study we picked is titled Are News Games Better Journalism? And it's written by Christoph Plewe and Elfred Füssig uh, from the University of Berlin and Pittsburgh, respectively. Uh, we selected this study because we found it to be the most fitting content lengthwise and um, because it's somewhat recent uh, and we didn't want to make you all read a very heavy paper before the last, uh, <laughs> the day before the last year. Uh, so th this study aims to interrogate if news games truly are a meaningful supplement to existing journalism and how they depict the issues surrounding refugees. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, great. Method analysis. Uh, this study analyzes and compares how three different games convey the same message. This message being immigration. Uh, the games are the Refugee Challenge by The Guardian and Against All Odds by the uh, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, these games depict the, the Syrian migration crisis in Europe, but, also, but there's also the Migrant Trail by Gigantic Mechanic, which focuses on illegal border crossing into the United States, Mexico, and South America. Uh, you could say that uh, the refugee challenge is more of a text-based um, article with multiple uh, multiple paths, kind of like the device game we showed earlier. Uh, and the migrant trail is not a supplement to an article, but is a supplement to a documentary movie with investigative investigative invent, event, intent. I'm sorry, English is very difficult today. Uh, the only Outlier here is Against All Odds, which is made by the United Nations, so it's not uh, um, a typical journalistic piece, but uh, as the uh, definition for news games is so vague, you could say that it's a news game, but you could also say it's educational, for example. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the way they analyze these games, they use methods and described by uh, researchers Diane Carr, Espen Orset, and Jose Zagal. Um, they uh, mostly compare um, the textual aspects of the game, meaning the, the content and messaging, and see how they are, uh, uh, how they are described. Uh, and they also replay the games multiple times to uh, make sure that they get all, uh, all possible endings and uh, events, since most of these, many of these games have multiple branching paths and etc. Uh, if we're going to give uh, the paper a bit of criticism right away, we would say that the method analysis part could be more fleshed out as it doesn't give very much insight into exactly how they analyzed it, though they do clarify this a bit later in the, con uh, in the text. So now I'll go over to Vilde, who will describe the three games uh, in more detail for you. I'll try to not make this extremely long, but uh, they are quite uh, extensive games, most of these, except the first one. Uh, so, um, I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Um, the Refugee Challenge, uh, as uh, we have mentioned a couple of times already, is a short uh, interactive text-based game. It's, or it's more like a feature on the on a website of a newspaper called The Guardian. It's from 2014 and it's not really a digital game in the traditional sense where you have graphics and gameplay and mechanics like, you know, jumping and stuff. Uh, it's more like a choose your own adventure uh, where you make decision on what the character does. So the game mechanic is uh, clicking through the uh, 
uh, articles. Uh, the path is not predefined, and uh, although there is one final ideal outcome uh, of uh, these uh, this series of articles, uh, there are so many uh, paths you can take. The story uh, revolves around a 28-year-old refugee woman who has kids, and she tries to flee from Syria to protect them. As you play the game, the information about refugees from Syria is uh, kind of made through choices and also the limitations of your choices, as well as links to traditional media content or websites. Um, and the player gets information about the current situation and also suggested paths through the text. Uh, the way this uh, information is laid out is non-linear and it makes it possible to miss some information if you choose certain routes, which makes the player have to explore the information in several sessions. So in some ways it's kind of like a game book. I don't know if some of you have read those books uh, as a kid or uh, even now maybe, where it's like uh, uh, go to page 76 if you want to open the door or uh, go to page 90 for opening the window or whatever. And uh, the ultimate goal here in this, uh, this article uh, game is to get to uh, asylum in Sweden, but there's also several other end game outcomes. Uh, but which prompts the user to continue and explore the different endings because of the links and such that they are presented with along the game. Uh, since not all information is accessible at once, the player needs to find out stuff through action and which action leads to success and which don't. There's also some external links and information uh, through other sources like BBC and uh, uh, also uh, um, there's also some uh, alternative endings that, uh, for instance, when you end up in Greece, uh, the um, uh, prompt will tell you to start over again to see how things would have turned out with different choices because of all the uh, because of the desperate situation the refugees will face in Greece, which is also linked through external links and for more information. Let's see. And then the next one is Against All Odds. Uh, it's made by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees from 2005. And this is a web-based game that uh, consists of 12 different uh, segments that is put together in three parts that use different mechanics. Uh, and the three parts are war and conflict, running from persecution, border country, can I stay here, and new life, loss and challenge. So the names of the uh, parts kind of describe what's going on in them. So you're basically fleeing from a country and then getting to a country that uh, you can stay in, and then you have to adjust to your new life here. And you do this through mini games, such, like, uh, such as finding a place to stay or apply for political asylum. These mini games are controlled by mouse and your actions uh, are performed uh, different ways in different mini games, such as having uh, the mouse control investigate or pick up or search for in the different games. Uh, and like in the refugee challenge, uh, this game does not let uh, the player explore different different possible outcomes uh, of the actions, even though it sometimes looks like you can. But uh, the game kind of doesn't let you choose unless you choose the right option. And although this can look like there's a fly in the design of the game, it can also be seen as a very intriguing way of conveying information because it forces you to have to take difficult moral choices and decisions that uh, induce emotions in you, such as having to leave a friend behind or having to uh, um, write a contract that basically gives away all of your rights as a human. And when you're con uh, consciously restraining the player like this, it can be a very effective way of telling the message. And the game also comments on your actions and scolds you for doing uh, unwise decisions, as they call it, because uh, they also tell you what you should have done if the situation was real. Because, of course, you have to make difficult decisions when you are uh, fleeing from uh, uh, your country. Uh, this um, paired with the time limits on some of the mini games uh, makes the game really stressful sometimes. And this uh, can make the player feel to some extent what the character is feeling or what a refugee would be feeling. Uh, this uh, game also provides a lot of uh, additional information online, such as the uh, refugee challenge. And uh, you can choose yourself if you want to look into more information after playing the game. This game is no longer available online, it seems. Uh, we were not able to find that list, and the, all the links that linked to it uh, led to uh, just the front page of the UN uh, refugee commissioner thing, I think. Uh, so we were sadly not able to actually play this. 
And then the last one is the Migrant Trail, uh, developed by Gigantic Mechanic in 2013. And it is, uh, as Vega said, a supplement to a documentary about undocumented uh, Mexicans who would cross the Sonoran Desert to get into the United States. Uh, to the right here, you can see the, uh, the character selection screen of the game. And that's how you start. You have to select the character and all the other characters are locked now because you have to play through all of them to get to the next one. Uh, in the game, you play either as the Border Patrol Guard or as the Migrants. And the game rules mechanics differ between the two groups and changes the situation a lot and the experience of the game. Uh, so there's a lot of different gameplay depending on what you choose. The game portrays uh, immigrants as forced to do uh, this immigration from like political, economic or personal reasons. And uh, it conveys the message of how dangerous it is uh, uh, of a journey and like what kind of different uh, reasons you could have for taking this uh, dangerous journey, even though it's obviously dangerous. Uh, you have to choose this character at the start and then purchase supplies for the trip and uh, then leave for the desert. And here you need to manage resources and choose between helping yourself and helping your fellow migrants. The border control is also presented as having their own viewpoints and individual backgrounds which affect the gameplay. And the main gameplay here is to help as many migrants as possible in a five hour working shift, which is about five minutes in gameplay. Uh, you follow tracks into the desert and help uh, migrants. And uh, even if you are really good at the game, uh, you still get a negative uh, ending when you play as a border patrol, uh, because no matter how well you do, the game score still tells you that uh, many more South Americans die than you can save. And that also if you save them, they get deported back to Mexico. So you can't really get a positive outcome. Uh, it's actually very easy to get a negative ending in general in this game. I was not able to get anyone into America when I was trying to play it. And uh, this is probably because around 200 people every year die while they're trying to cross this desert, and that is reflected in the gameplay. In addition to cartoon graphics, this game also uses real photos and videos to convey the story and message. Uh, let's see, didn't I have a photo of that as well? I guess I didn't. Uh, no, actually I have it later. Um, yeah. And there's also a website that you can explore that uh, shows you where how many uh, dead immigrants have been discovered in the desert since 1981. Uh, yeah. So these games all have like a very common uh, message that they all focus on getting empathy for the migrants. And this is uh, kind of opposed to uh, how the normal media does it because uh, they often focus on the negative aspects of this because uh, that's uh, all often what uh, sells best. Um, but here they let the player play out the role of the refugees and immigrants and experience all the hardships that they had to go through. Um, one of the major uh, points that they use to make you give this sort of empathy for the characters is that you, they put, uh, um, they use the word you a lot in the dialogue and they make like, uh, can you cross the border or can you uh, get into Europe and things like that. And they also uh, avoid using uh, potential dissimilarities such as religion, customs or political affliction because they want the focus to be on what's, uh, what we can all agree on uh, such as uh, actions that violate human rights. This makes it easier to not let the player be affected by their own bias and instead experience the character as a fellow human being. However, this can also be problematic because it erases the differences that do exist and are important. Uh, in addition to this, there's also a lot of aesthetic choices in the game that prompts us to identify and empathize with the refugees. In Against All Odds, the player character um, are colored with pleasing and vivid colors and appealing designs, while the enemies, such as military police or xenophobic people, are portrayed with muted colors and gray. In the Refugee Challenge, uh, you also use uh, real life video and photos to elicit emotions, such as uh, video interviews with actual refugees. Uh, here's that picture I was looking for. Um, yeah. Uh, some of the games uh, they try to, or all of the games, they try to make the player feel what we call parallel empathy, which is dependent on two factors, uh, the game design and the player's own appraisal of the situation. Uh, for instance, 
uh, I guess all of us on the migrant trail have elements that let the player and experience dramatic things that refugees have to go through, such as having to act against one's will, make difficult moral decisions, and being under acute stress. This, this is an example from migrant trail on the right, uh, where you have to choose between helping yourself or helping it, or leaving this guy behind because he got bit by a scorpion, or use your own supplies from your backpack, which you might need later, or do nothing, or leave him. If you do nothing, he will slow you down and make your journey harder. And the games also contain elements that, that give you reactive empathy, which is a feeling of sympathy or pity towards the refugees. This can be by providing insight into personal backgrounds and etc. Their stories and things like that. Uh, by doing this, a personal connection can be made between the player and the migrants. And this form of reactive empathy can be really intensified by making the player feel responsible for the life of the refugees through the choices that they have to make in the game, such as having to leave Augustine behind in the, the migrant trail would be very sad. Uh, all of these three games presented are contain the possibility to fail and have a negative or dissatisfying ending. This can be as small as making a fool of yourself on the first day of school and being ridiculed by other students, or as large as being caught by the military police and dying. Um, and uh, some parts of the games are designed to contain really difficult passages that demand critical observation and reflection on what's happening in the game. And having these sorts of situations can really lead the player to gaining subjective insights uh, through playing the game. So that you will sit um, with the, uh, the emotions that you feel in the game, you will carry them on with you after you play the game, not just forget about it afterwards. And then I think we are onto the discussion part. Uh, or Vega will talk something uh, about that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so after having conducted the analysis, the authors came up with some statements regarding the points uh, raised. Uh, first being objectivity, as Andre pointed out in the break. Um, from their observations, they could confidently claim that none of the games are very objective. Their goals was to create awareness for migrants and their plights and counter stereotyping, uh, but they fail to add different perspectives and are therefore very one-sided, thus making these games very clear examples of editorials, the subgenre I explained before. Uh, if you need a reminder, those are news games with a developed bias. <clears throat> uh, but all the games were also additives to existing articles and other forms of uh, journalism, meaning that none of them were 100% standing on their own legs or claiming to contain all the information. Uh, maybe except for um, uh, the Refugee Challenge, I'd say, since that is basically an interactive article, but still. Uh, Going back to objectivity, the last game, The Migrant Trail, tries to ensure its objectivity by letting the player choose different players, player characters with different motivations and goals on both sides of the conflict, meaning there's different motivations among not only the refugees, but there are different uh, motivations along the border patrols as well. Uh, like on the migration side, you have like real or valid migrants, you could say, with... Uh, uh, um, valid uh, reasons and excuse uh, uh, motivations but there's also one character that's a drug trafficker that uh, shows that not there are crimes and there are problems uh, with this on the border patrol side there's a white uh, border guard who is a christian and feels very bad for the migrants and wants to help them but has to do his job but there are also two other guards who are also of uh, mexican or south american origin uh, who has some sort of a disdain towards the migrants for doing it the illegal way because they themselves are legal immigrants. Uh, this way, the migrant trail tries to evolve past the boundaries of conventional journalism, though the authors think they could have elaborated this further. <clears throat> As for information complexity, uh, all three games rely on traditional media. Uh, well, that being web-based articles, I don't know if that counts as traditional media, but it's certainly more so than these games. Uh, the plan is to supplement the player with information throughout the game, encouraging them to read more, or at least in theory. Uh, however, the authors found that the long fragments of text and the uh, images that they were presented in the refugee challenge and against all odds would break and interrupt the game flow, uh, which could possibly lead to people becoming disinterested uh, in the game as a whole. 
Uh, they also say that when games are dependent on such mechanics to convey information, they cannot truly break free and become their own medium, which uh, might be a reason why news games seem to be so loosely defined amongst uh, other forms of serious games. <clears throat> then we come back to uh, distant suffering, or what uh, Vilde called earlier, uh, compassion fatigue. Uh, one aspect they talk about is the notion of distant suffering and how these games may alleviate this. Distant suffering is a phenomenon that describes when problems far away are sort of dehumanized uh, as it doesn't really affect the people hearing about it directly. Uh, this is also exaggerated by compassion fatigue as we described earlier, meaning you get overwhelmed and desensitized to uh, the, the suffering of place of the world as you it's so overrepresented in the media. Uh, the authors discuss the possibility that games like these ones uh, may alleviate uh, the f this phenomena as it helps the readers slash players put themselves into the shoes of refugees and get some insights as they directly engage the player. Uh, the mini games and against all odds were specifically noted to be very um, to be a very good example of this as they uh, have a number of different situations, some of which can also be very relatable to uh to westerners you could say such as being in a new school or etc and it can thus instill like this sense of fear or stress and thus make it more uh, relatable than a standard uh, article uh, they also comment on the playfulness of the cartoonish graphics can siege can be trivializing uh, as i mentioned earlier uh, they do have a note that the real images and interviews and text that they that they use to accompany these games can uh, serve as a sort of reality check to ensure that you don't lose sight of, of the, that, that this is a real situation. Uh, a good quote said by Lee is, it transforms play from a gaming action into a thinking event from a means of fun to a, from a means of fun seeking to a scheme of uh, revelations of the game's critical engagements. Um, However, they do also state that if games like this become popular enough, they can also like just further exaggerate the problem of um, desensitization and such. So careful design is always required. <clears throat> then at last, I will just briefly touch on ideology. Uh, the game's ideology is, of course, based on the ideology of their developers. Uh, the Guardian, for example, is a left-leaning Paper, so they will of course present the refugees in a positive light. If it had been a more conservative paper, they probably wouldn't have done the same. Uh, uh, arguments are not made through the construction of words or images, but through authorship of rules and behavior, the construct construction of dynamic models, which is a quote by Bogos we really like. Uh, the, game the games analyzed in this study destabilized the European and American-based perspectives by putting the player in the shoes of the refugees, and in doing so, attempting to disrupt the problematic representations of migrants. Uh, the migrants replaced, the, however, may be a little too clean, as the graphics and story may wash away cultural and religious aspects uh, in an effort to try to create likable and relatable protagonists. Uh, but then that way they can also be criticized for sanitizing human behavior and creating sort of a false and clean image, you could say. So this is a very sensitive matter which has to be handled very well. Now we'll go over to the conclusion. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The conclusion of the paper is pretty much that uh, the debate of journalism and news games is very polarized. There one side kind of expects it to revolutionize journalism, while the other thinks it trivializes, uh, you know, very ser serious issues and uh, geopolitical problems. Uh, however, what the paper uh, kind of thinks uh, of as its conclusion, uh, conclusion is that both sides are exaggerating and that news games are less impactful than some people wish and some people fear. Well, there's some definitely some strong point, points uh, and that the games can pot potentially enhance journalism through good game design uh, and that the uh, games can also add dimension to the news that the traditional journalism can't. However, there is also some clear weaknesses. There is a very problematic binary present where things are either only good or only bad in some of the cases, and that some problems only have only one solution, which is a very big oversimplification of complex situations that need to be addressed uh, in a more broad way than it often does. 
while the overly critical voices may also be exaggerating in the paper's opinion, because uh, uh, the new schemes are good for contextualizing and enhancing the journalistic content of principles. Uh, it doesn't cheapen it. It doesn't. Uh, it's not a downhill move in every way, um, because uh, it enhances the journalistic uh, content of principles, and also it's still a supplementary to traditional new media news media. It's not. It's not standing on its own just yet, so I don't think we need to be afraid that uh, newspapers and normal traditional journalism will appear just yet and be replaced by news games. And that's uh, basically it. Uh, now that it's time for the class discussion of the paper. I'm not sure how, how many people thank had time to read it, but uh, hopefully some. <laughs> no, thank Thanks you. for listening. Thanks for listening, yeah. Well, thank you very much for your for your talk, extensive talk, I would say. Uh, so initially, uh, Vega highlighted that you may have issues filling that uh, time slot at all, and I have the impression you you overdid it. So that that was well done. Uh, I also liked really the systematic build up in the beginning, where you actually highlighted what news is about, including the discussion and different perspectives on this analytical methods uh, approach, and relating it, of course, to similar uh, you know um, 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 categories such as specifically propaganda games right which is a really like a very fuzzy line and uh, i think you did a great job in trying to figure out where you know how to draw the boundary and i have the impression at least for yourself you have very clearly drawn the boundary there that you have a clear understanding what is one uh, and not the other so um, thank you very much i think it was very uh, helpful in getting a, a a a clear perspective on what news games are and uh, you, you gave us a glimpse into the uh, depth of the games that are actually existing, right? Because there's a plethora of different games and you had not so much the problem of probably finding them, but probably the challenge of actually uh, selecting them, right? So they have a sufficient uh, but meaningful representation because as you, as you noticed yourself, they're really short-lived, right? Short-lasting and don't really have an extended lifespan. So it's a tricky one. So uh, thank you very much for this. I mean, it was really good. Um, and also the paper, how you dissected it. In fact, the paper choice is very, very interesting because it's quite divergent from all the, or from many of the other papers we saw because it has such a focus on a very different analytical approach, very qualitative and very, um, well, uh, subjective uh, uh, perspective on analysis, right? So it makes it quite different from the papers we saw. And I think this is good for you to, um, uh, for you here as a class, to kind of get the opportunity to see such a paper because it's not something, at least from a computer science perspective, that we commonly see. Um, so that, that's very important to, to, to bear in mind that those kind of studies exist as well. So in this slide, thank you very much. Um, but before giving uh, any further comments, is there anyone else who wants to chip in or, uh, um, you know, um, contribute, ask questions or the like? Because else I have a few ones. Not really. Nobody? Not yet. Okay. <clears throat> well, I have a few. Um, so uh, we, we, you can keep an eye on the chat and cut me short or when, whenever someone shows up. Um, so what I want to know, I mean, you did a really good job in highlighting the perspective and you gave me a glimpse, I think, a glimpse on what you think about this issue, right? So particularly if you looked at the conclusion, sorry, at the, the conclusion of the paper, I think that is two slides back. Uh, um, sorry. It should be one, one slide back. This one? Yes. Yeah, this is uh, kind of the complete conclusion of the paper, but I think, uh, I think we mostly agree on what the paper concluded with. Uh -huh. But so, so in in your view, would would you think we should um, foster and popularize the use of news games? Basically, you know, in an ideal world, do you think every article should be accompanied, perhaps, with a news game to kind of substitute or embed it or to enrich it? Or uh, are, you, are, the, are you critical there? I mean, you know, it's it's just an open question. There's no right and wrong, <laughs> unlike in <laughs> apparently news games. But uh, uh, so, just to give you a perspective, what do you think? Uh, if I can go first, yeah, uh, go for it. Ideally, that would be great. But uh, from a realistic standpoint, the development time uh, and the complexity of many topics, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's ever going to really take over. Uh, I think it's something we will see more and more that will just pop up here and there. I can definitely see there be some COVID nineteen news games coming. Mm -hmm. um, but it is the fact that uh, you have to try to strive for objectivity at least to a certain degree and with the 
the media image that is today, I, I think it could be used in maybe some uh, maleficent uh, uh, manner, such as uh, uh, Andre pointed out. So, mm. but I, I think it's definitely interesting and something that would be fun to see be expanded more. Yeah, yeah. I think I agree uh, a lot with Vega uh, that I don't think it's going to be. Uh, uh, we're never going to get all our news uh, through news games, but I think it's a very good supplementary, uh, especially uh, uh, this game that we talked about, the Migrant Trail. Uh, it's a very good supplement to the uh, documentary, and it also makes me want to watch the documentary just by playing the news games because it's uh, very extensive and gets you really close into the issue. Hmm. But I don't think it'll ever be used for uh, for talking about breaking news because it's uh, there's a development process that you need to go through, and it, you won't make good news games if you only have a week or a day to make it. Uh, I I did the uh, I we haven't mentioned this in the paper, but I did find that uh, it was one of the authors we mentioned. I don't know if it was Pleve or if it was somebody else. I don't remember, but they are developing a sort of tool to sort of like an RPG maker to let people create news games more quickly. But uh, it seems to be very early in development still. So I think it was called, um, I don't remember, sorry. <laughs> I can see if I can find it. Uh, Yeah, Clara writing in the chat here. No, I yes. can't find it. Most of the good ones seem to be used for ongoing news topics. Yeah, Clara, I mm -hmm. think so too. It's like topics that don't disappear quickly. That's uh, mm -hmm. usually makes sense to use it for. I, I can't find it now, but it will definitely be in my uh, in my paper. <laughs> and Nakul right, has a good question. You want to say anything, Nakul? Yeah, um, I have two comments in general. Uh, one is that if we are thinking of news games, uh, it can be viewed in a way that uh, a particular event in the history, uh, for example, if you go back a bit um, in the past, maybe World War One, So there could be a game uh, which talks about this entire series of events in a from one perspective or on multiple perspectives. And that particular time span can be told as uh, news. Uh, so we need to be very selective about uh, what events or what news do we select to put it into a game, because otherwise the other uh, news media are uh, sufficient enough to get that to the audience. Um, for example, an app or a newspaper or a simple web article. Um, so it could be viewed in a way of archiving important events in the history of uh, humankind. And another aspect of I wanted to uh, just say was the intrinsic motivation of uh, humans going after news is to understand what happened and uh, to really know different perspectives. Now, this could be capitalized in the game uh, by game designers and developers saying that people want to know more and that could act as a currency to make them explore a particular area of their choice. So that uh, can be really good um, tool to make them use it in cases where uh, there is an immersive uh, news game or something similar to that. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, it's con it can probably make it very engaging if you have to discover uh, the bits and pieces of uh, the whole picture on, on your own. That's uh, what you mm -hmm. meant. As with uh, going back in time, um, usually news games are defined that the, the events have to be relevant. Uh, although we did do, do some um, uh, exceptions for this, as we mentioned, uh, JFK Reload and Super Combat Massacre RPG, which are both events that happened a long time ago, but um, like the events surrounding them are still relevant enough to to investigate it, you could say. So, 
I could, you could probably also use like uh, things from World War Two to talk about the neo-Nazi things uh, these days, which is still oh, a relevant thing. Uh, Jakob, Jakob says yeah. what, yeah. what Nakul is describing is actually very similar to an existing game called Valiant Hearts. That's true. That's pretty, uh, if it's if it, I don't know if it's the one I'm thinking about it, but if it's the game I think it is, it's uh, pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. So yeah, if you if you could go back to World War One to find a topic that is still relevant today, you could say, for example, I know that for example relating to World War One, I think there's a field in the Ardennes which is still very heavily riddled with mines, but that might be World War Two. But you could probably find something there. Mm. Use existing nar- news articles from that time to make it. Yeah, you could make retro news games. Hmm. Hmm. That could I think be a that's a. Uh, but then it would maybe be history yeah. games, not news games. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. It's a bit blurry. <laughs> I mean, the the definition is so broad that uh, and like and nobody seems to agree on anything. So <laughs> that's uh, the impression I got from reading all the articles. I've been true yes. that they they don't really agree. <laughs> that was the first thing we said. That news games is very loosely defined. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, you can introduce a new genre, old news games, perhaps. Um, <laughs> but um, the um, so just, just I, mean, I was thinking more on this, pondering on this, this news and accommodation and so on, especially long-running issues such as Clara said, like you know, uh, COVID, um, migrants crisis, um, 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 uh, probably terrorism some time ago, and, and JFK and so on, which is probably an old news games in a way uh, example already of this, right? Um, but um, the 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 question is. Do you risk providing, and sorry, that's more like a political societal questions, but don't you risk um, providing populists with fodder effectively? Um, because, you know, if, 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 if one of the criticisms of those news games is the oversimplified or trivialized representation of, uh, you know, of problems, which on the one hand makes it accessible to a broader audience, but at the same time, uh, uh, wouldn't it uh, make news games then the perfect um, mechanism, uh, you know, that, that for example, <laughs> the currently emerging European right-wing parties should actually adopt in order to mobilize their masses, uh, or you know, to, to kind of to kind of sway uh, them towards their cause. Do, do you see that risk, or is that uh, am I over, overthinking it? That's actually a thought I had a lot while uh, while researching this paper, um, because the, the problem with news games is that they want to give you deeper insights, but to get that deeper insight, you have to play the game. And with how divisive politics seem to be and all this, uh, people don't seem that interested in trying something when they know, oh, this is um, uh, this is very sympathetic towards another course, so therefore I won't interact with it. So it could possibly be more divisive as well, mm-hmm. which is why we I really like the migrant trail because it's so it tries to be so very in the middle with uh, acknowledging that oh yeah, there are also problems with. My, uh, migrants and such so that they they get both sides in there kind of without being very uh, oh I don't find the word I'm looking for uh, a pretentious you could say mm. I mean there's even like a, one of the migrants that's trying to cross into the US is also like a, a criminal that's yeah. been like kicked out of uh, for a gang related uh, crime I think it was Hmm. Challenging. Right. But it's uh, definitely a challenge and a lot of pitfalls. So I think it's somewhere you have to be uh, deeply critical of yourself and what you're making. Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, that, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Mm. Hmm. Awesome. I, I just <laughs> want to liken it to the uh, you know uh, in in many countries um, or at least in, in across the globe, there is a problem with media more more generally already, right? So like either either political leaders uh, uh, dissuade people from actually following the media in the first place or the media are evidently uh, controlled in a way that makes them not 
consumable, at least if you want to have some sort of objective, I don't know what that is, but any, some mm. sort of, you know, actual news. So uh, in those countries, in many respects, people actually, you know, rely on Facebook, right? So WhatsApp and so on, shared messages and so on. So, and, and the question is, you know, for news games can substitute or, or, or contribute to this uh, confusion to some extent, right? Because they're also medium that could be easily brought into those platforms, you know, Facebook games, for example, and, 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 and lead to political sway quite easily. I suspect so uh, you know in a very entertaining but uh, promising but also dangerous manner so it's a really uh, um, uh, two-sided uh, uh, um, sword I guess right so yeah anyway I think yeah so uh, Clara sums it up quite well I guess uh, in, a, in a comment down there um, the, the the final question that I have, I'm not sure if I'm, interrupt me immediately if anyone uh, wants to eject, but the final question I have, did you find any evidence on adoption or level of play, right? Yeah, so but we have a lot of hypotheses right now, you know, how powerful they are. Uh, the article gives us a good uh, uh, um, baseline to assess in how far, you know, those those how those games can be analyzed in the first place, what opportunities they have, the risks, the shortcomings and so on. But realistically, who plays those games? Is there any evidence? I don't know. I'm just asking mostly. There was actually very little uh, to find about who is playing these games and what uh, uh, what kind of effect it has. I think uh, I think it was mentioned that there's very few uh, uh, research or uh, very little research done on the effect of new games, news games. I mean, um, so I didn't find much about it sadly. But there was something that I tried to look for. Mm. I'm not sure what uh, you found, Vega. Uh, this is more of a, um, because I do actually remember playing Die First Dying when I was young. <laughs> uh, yeah, same, I also remember that. Because I'm guessing that they are shared, uh, they're probably being played by the readers of the respective newspapers is what I'm guessing. Uh, but I do know that there, there used to be, at least in the early 2000s, there was a lot of uh, websites that would share Flash games and such, and that's where I found uh, Die First Dying. There was one of those uh, websites that actually we read about that used to have uh, its own uh, category for news games. So there was somebody playing them. Uh, there's also a website called newsgames.com where you can find a lot of these games. Mm. So it seems, to, it seems to have at least somewhat of a fan base, but I don't know how wide or how intricate it is. Uh, I think the start of the article uh, read for today uh, talked about how uh, news games uh, was uh, important to reach out to new uh, on new markets because uh, most young people don't uh, they don't consume media in the same way as uh, earlier generations so I have an impression that it's uh, sort of meant to you know uh, cater to millennials and younger mm. that's just my assumption though yeah, that sounds. Uh, yeah, it's probably not not unrealistic in a way. Um, but in in this light, it's quite a this research is, is hard to undertake, right? Because there's no standardized way of assessing the adoption in the first place, to some extent. But also the uh, fast moving nature of those games, right? So I mean, you, you yourself figured out uh, <laughs> you wanted to actually explore them, and even if you want to, it, you're hardly able to, right? Because they vanish as fast as they come, it seems. So that's a bit of a, um, a pity to see because they, they seem to represent some sort of uh, uh, yeah, artistic, I don't know what, what we would put it, a, a, um, uh, they capture the respective zeitgeist, right? That underlies a particular um, a problem trend or issue at hand. So it would be a good move perhaps to even ensure that they are at least get archived in the first place so that this kind of analysis can happen or take place, uh, you know, yeah, in the first place. So it's a bit of a pity there. Yeah. Anyway, that was something we talked about when we were uh, uh, discussing this paper on our own, that uh, we really wish there was some kind of archive, uh, if not by the people who made it, but at least by the people who uh, analyzed uh, them and made this paper to have mm. them available somewhere for people who will read this paper later on. Mm. This is from 2017, so it has to have disappeared quite recently. True, right. Yeah, this is uh, yeah very short-lived. Yeah, and I think there was an effort 
um, uh, that went up to 2012, roughly, I believe, to, to um, systematically archive serious games, not archive, but at least document them, their existence. But even there, I think this, this, this effort has died down quite a bit. So it's a bit of a pity there that it has become out of fashion, if you like. So um, that's um, something to be, to be recognized. I think that applies to pretty much all the serious games topics that we have discussed so far. Um, um, yeah, they, they suffer from this. That it's really hard to write about something you can't really try to some extent, um, let alone having more information about it, yes. Well, great. Are there any more comments by questions or injections by any individuals? Well, thank you very much for the presentation and the discussion then. I think you went really deep and um, um, I think you should uh, um, take the opportunity to um, introduce many of the aspects that we have discussed right now, you know, to, to um, or I assume you discussed them in your paper to some extent, right? So um, that you are uh, submitting for the course because there's quite an opportunity to uh, uh, um, at least suggest what should be done better in the future, right? So or what, what could have been done uh, for selected um, uh, instances of serious games uh, more, more systematically. And of course, the social challenges that come with this, right? So it's a bit of a moral dilemma associated with this, similar to, for example, health games, right? Where we have a similar kind of concern. So um, that's really worthwhile mm. discussing. Okay. Yep. Well, I am left with thanking you very much for the uh, presentation at this stage. And in fact, largely for the participation in the course, at least what, what when it comes to our uh, shared experience as a, as a class. Um, so um, that um, will conclude pretty much the last session for now. Um, but I want to give you the opportunity, in addition to uh, having experienced the uh, presentation on news games right now, to ask potential further questions you might have. Um, for example, regarding the ongoing procedure and the oral exams, I highlighted, well, questions is uh, uh, overstating here a bit. I mean, I made some statements about how we gonna run the oral exam and I provide, of course, an issue that outlines how it's done. But uh, in, in practice, it will run like this, that you will be uh, joining us in a Zoom link and in a waiting room, and then we'll admit you in order of uh, presentation. The uh, You have committed to timings, um, the slots that you actually want to use to um, have the oral exam. Mind that there may be some, uh, you know, waiting time left or right associated with this, right? Sometimes um, um, interactions go faster, sometimes slower and so on. We kind of play around this a bit uh, to kind of optimize or streamline the whole approach. So just be uh, mindful of this, that it's sometimes we overrun in certain um, sessions. Um, uh, or not, or may, we may call you in earlier if you're there already in the waiting room and so on. Just have some flexibility. When it comes to the exam itself, um, so the most important point is uh, to, to have an overview of all the topics that have been talked about. That includes, of course, the lectures given by uh, Rune and myself, um, and, and then the underlying concepts that we discuss so frequently, uh, being it psychological models, being it um, the um, development frameworks for games, um, so basically which provides some sort of analytical basis as well, but also the um, topic specific um, 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 themes um, that, that have been discussed. And I'm not asking you to learn slides by heart, that's really not helpful, but to get an understanding uh, of what those areas are about, reflecting a bit on this, relating those and how far they did. For example, news games and propaganda games was an obviously uh, related topic area, which is really um, useful to hear about today. Um, again, and um, of course, be ready to answer questions ago, uh, about your specific paper. That is um, of central, central concern in the discussion uh, and you know to reflect on it and um, uh, expand the discussion. But of course, also more general questions such as, you know, what are serious games, what you are thinking, what serious games are, the, the purposes underlying it, and so on. So um, it's quite general um, in, in this slide. But point is, I think for e every question you may ask, you will have an answer, right? So that, that will not be the problem. It's not like uh, that you need to learn something by heart and you get it right or wrong. It's just a matter of um, uh, reflecting on your um, um, uh, um, Yep. understanding and interpretation of serious games more generally in the light of what we've heard. And there's a lot we have heard uh, in this course, I admit that. So um, in preparation for this, and just to recall uh, some of the um, issues, I would like to reiterate my um, um, encouragement to, to upload slides um, by everyone, right? So everyone should provide the slide set associated with the issues 
um, that they posted on GitLab um, in conjunction with the papers that they posted so people can follow up by systematically walking through those issues um, specifically. That was pretty much all I wanted to say. Are there any specific questions or concerns that people want to drill deeper into? If you want to, you can just basically speak up. Um, I don't think there's massive competition right now. <laughs> and otherwise, you can still follow up by um, issues, of course, or uh, why. Uh, yeah, hello. Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I've got the, the following question. I've had some issues with locking in my, my time slot for the oral exam. Uh, if I have done it just now, or, uh, at the start of the session today, uh, is that still fine? Because uh, yeah. I've placed it there twice, uh, at least I thought I did. Mm. But it uh, never showed up the next time I checked. So, so which 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 slot do you think you have IRI? I think it's thirteen twenty-five on Monday. Is that correct? Yeah, that should, should be correct. So let's see. Let's hope it's there in the next half an hour. Uh, that would be okay. It's it's useful. been there for for like two hours now. So I'm I'm very uh, I'm You're quite confident. sure it's it's working now. Um, I just said I was a bit confused because it didn't seem to stick. Yeah, that is uh, that would be very unfortunate. Um, so um, yeah, no, I mean. Uh, slots, um, um, please don't overwrite each other's slots. I think that's a very sensible demand on our part. Other than this, we'll be reasonably agile when it comes to the allocations. I mean, if, if, if anyone wants to opportunistically swap at this stage, I mean, there's not much space left. We have one slot left. So it worked out quite nicely. Um, then, then they can well do so. But uh, uh, we pretty much take it as it comes uh, by the next weekend, pretty much as uh, preparation. Because in the end, uh, we'll, we'll review everything that people submitted. And that is the primary challenge we're going through anyway right so the reports you're going to submit uh, by uh, tonight of course submission deadline is did midnight um, sorry i didn't explicitly specify it in the uh, wiki uh, i was i was um, prompted on this in, in discord which is absolutely sensible you're right so midnight tonight is the official deadline for this so because uh, we tonight yeah. or to tomorrow uh, isn't the fifth so it's, it's the fifth yeah oh is it the fifth sorry yes tomorrow then um ah old people yes sorry um i have uh, yeah my, my 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 machine has the inverted clock it yeah it has the american format it trips me up all the time um all right um so um yeah of course tomorrow night i'm very sorry yeah uh, but it would be good to submit by then um because we need some time to read them uh, you will recognize that we have a, lot, a considerable number of reports ahead of us so it'd be really good if you could commit to that deadline um good I saw some people have submitted already, which is good. And we hope to see a bit more of this um, in the next few days. Any other questions? I sense not. Good. Um, yeah, in case issues come up, uh, Discord or um, um, uh, issue tracker and so like. Uh, yeah. So um, if yeah. So if anything, yeah, contact me either issues uh, email or Discord. Um, if it's more public, it's probably issues. Um, you know, it's related to everyone because. Um, but if it's more an individual kind of question, then of course uh, Discord will do as well. So uh, uh, let me again the speakers for today. So it's really, really good um, what uh, Wilde and Vega have presented to us. I think it's really um, uh, the, the way kind of I anticipated those lectures, having a really thorough background in, in terms of theory, systematic build up, uh, keeping people entertained, potential opportunities for interactivity, you know, uh, um, which is sometimes hard in those uh, sessions here. So it's a bit easier in a class, conventional classroom session, of course, than in a digital one. And then a really good discussion of the paper itself. Uh, uh, while unfortunately they have done most of the discussion, discussion themselves, so it could have been more of a classroom experience, but that uh, shall not damage their effort. Um, so thank you very much again. And um, I wish you guys a... Um, successful uh, final period in writing up the uh, papers and hope to see you in your respective um, or exam sessions next week. Again, as I mentioned before, just get in touch if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you.